Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Today we're pleased to have Doug Grissom share with us. Doug will be talking about his journey over the last year, which he has entitled, A Year of Humbling. This is Real Lives. These services are just an opportunity for us as the people of God to share about our relationship with God. That can be in the form of a personal testimony, personal story, or perhaps about a ministry or initiative the Lord has led us to, or perhaps just something about our daily walk with God, really telling people how our story is fitting within God's story. Hello, it's a privilege to speak to you today. Thank you for listening. I've had quite a variety of jobs in my working career. The Lord has blessed me with work skills that generally produce good results. I enjoy the satisfaction of a job well done. My work ethic has always been strong, and I pride myself on doing whatever it takes to achieve success. There's that word, pride. It only took four sentences in describing my work and myself for that to crop up. Generally, when I start a job, I put very high standards upon myself. As I work at it, it almost always succeeds. It almost always results in lots of praise, positive feedback, and appreciation. This usually motivates me to do even more and continue to strive to achieve. Actually, I strive to overachieve. For me, the praise and approval are almost like a drug. The more I get, the more I want. And before I know it, I'm not doing the job out of a sense of service or duty, but to get the high approval and praise that I seek. This is where my sense of humility leaves the equation. Pride has taken over. Now I have to have positive feedback or I feel disrespected or unsupported. Often, this sense of injustice in my mind leads to frustration and ultimately to anger. This anger is my greatest shame. We're currently reading about King Saul. This is a man that seemingly started out okay. He tried very hard, but his jealousy and unhealthy need to be respected and his pride as the king led to his destruction. Let me tell you the story of one year in the life of King Doug. In the winter of 2019, I was beginning to get bored with a job that I'd started about three and a half years before. I had been recruited to move to a new company to start up a brand new purchasing department. It was a great challenge. I actually achieved pretty well everything I was brought on to do within the first one or two years. I was basically staying because in order to recruit me, I had negotiated a very good salary and excellent benefits. This was allowing me to forecast an early retirement, a comfortable retirement for Kath and I. I really wish along the way someone had told me that you shouldn't stay at a job just for the money. I'm kidding. I know that. Anyway, COVID hit. My company laid a bunch of people off, but not me. But what they did do is they gave me a, another person's role to meld into my own. So now I was doing the work of two people. We also were sent home to work from home and I had no support, I had no training, and I was struggling. I was really trying to achieve the results that I'm used to, and I simply couldn't. I hit the wall, and the stress uh, just got to me. I broke, and I lost my temper. I was put on stress leave for a week. Upon my return, when I went in to meet with my boss, I was fired. They basically told, they said that it was because of COVID, uh, which was actually a respectful thing to do, but I know that it was because of my behavior that I was fired. I had never been fired in 40 years of working. I was truly broken. 
My pride was at an all-time low. I was very angry. I was angry at my employer. I was really angry at myself. But I was also angry at God. I prayed earnestly to understand what God's plan and why was and why he put, was putting me through this. I did receive a fair severance package, so Kath and I decided that we were going to look at this as a bit of a gift and we were just going to spend the entire uh, summer at the cottage. We had never been able to do that before, so we truly were trying to look at this as a gift. This was to be the beginning of a wilderness experience. It was the wilderness of Grand Beach Provincial Park, but it was a wilderness experience. My confidence was shattered. I weakly looked for employment. I did have a number of interviews, and I actually got very close to being offered a couple of positions. But I was just terrified. Every time I got close, I pulled back and I declined to move forward. I was so afraid that given responsibility, eventually my anger and aggression would rear its ugly head again, and I'd just ruin another opportunity. So it was just easier to pull the plug early. By the grace of God, Kath and I came up with the idea of renting our house in the city on Airbnb for the summer, since we were at the cottage. We were actually quite surprised that we had a pretty steady stream of income that took care of our modest spending while we were at the cottage, so we stayed right through into the fall. It was truly a thank you, Lord, moment. Most every day, Kath and I would go for a long walk, and she would mostly listen to me talking out my hurt and my pain, and then she'd reassure me that things were going to work out. At the end of almost every walk, we would thank the Lord and reaffirm that it is he that he is taking care of us now as he always faithfully did in the past at the end of the summer i felt somewhat healed refreshed somewhat ready to face what the new challenges would be i had been visited by many close friends who had been very supportive and had really helped me to pray through and to work through my hurt and my pain I felt that the Lord was really leading me not to go back into private business, not to work for another large company, not to run a large department or do anything like that. I felt that I needed to commit myself to finding something where I could help others. So until a job came along, I decided that I might try to do some volunteering. As it happens, back in 2017 and 2018, I had gone through all the training required to be an emergency response team member for the Canadian Red Cross. Back then, I had just felt led to go through the courses. I didn't actually know why because I had a full-time job and I was never able to help with any of the responses. God was preparing me. So I, ke I had kept in touch with the logistics officer for Manitoba. So I phoned him up and it happened that he had moved his entire family out to BC that summer, but he was still managing the Manitoba logistics team um, for their deployments. He was very responsible, responsive to my call because he was in BC and he had nobody doing field operations in Manitoba. So he really needed help for a couple of engagements that the Red Cross were involved in. The Red Cross, were assisting in the long-term care facilities that had COVID outbreaks. And they were also managing an isolation hotel here in Winnipeg for First Nations people. People that were in First Nations community that found it very hard to isolate would be sent to Winnipeg in order to do their isolation. This was because they were COVID positive. So I started out just as a, as a courier. I had a truck and so I was driving PPE between uh, long-term care facilities and the isolation site. This was my first exposure to the front lines. The first time that I was asked to go to Maple's care home, I was pretty apprehensive. I had seen all the news stories, 
I had seen the bleak picture of the front of the building. It looked very sad. It looked very desperate. I was, like, as I said, I was nervous and apprehensive. Upon my arrival at the front door to deliver PPE, I literally was drawn to tears, seeing all the beautiful posters and messages hung all over the windows created by children and the community thanking all the frontline workers. It really was amazing. And then I met the workers. The people were amazing. They were obviously exhausted. They must have had tons of heartache, but they actually made a point of thanking me and asking me how I was doing. This was truly humble service. This was truly a, a thank you, Lord moment. I knew then that I really wanted to be a part of this. After about three or four weeks of volunteering in mid-November, I received a contract of employment offer from the Red Cross. I was to be the logistics field operation lead for these two operations. This was truly another thank you, Lord moment. I actually started the next day after receiving the contract and I reported to the isolation site. Due to some confusion over what my role was, but actually more so because of a severe shortage of workers, the site manager, after a very cursory training uh, orientation, showed me how to put on PPE and he sent me to the front lines. It was, so I was it, I had never worn PPE before. I had never seen uh, what this was like. So there I am with my gown and my gloves and my mask and a face shield, and I'm sent up to a floor with all COVID positive people to serve them their meals. I was terrified. But I persisted. I did what I was asked to do. I was also taught how to take them for breaks, to check people in, and to check people out. It wasn't really a thank you, Lord moment, though, I have to admit. Up to th this point, I didn't even know anybody that was COVID positive. Kath and I had been very, very careful. We followed all the guidelines. It was also very stressful for Kath. Each day when I'd come home, I'd phone Kath from the car just to make sure that she was nowhere near the back door so that I could come in. I would take off my shoes before going in the house. As Soon as I was in the house, I'd have to remove all my clothes, put them in a garbage bag, and I'd jump into a long hot shower before grabbing a beer and going upstairs to talk to Kath and to try to reassure her that everything was gonna be okay. She was always supportive. This is my ongoing thank you, Lord. Somewhat thankfully, after a few days of doing this, my logistics boss asked that I be moved more to logistics. This was a huge thank you, Lord. <laughs> Besides the PPE, there were many food and recreational items that, needed to that was needed to support the residents. But there was no systems in place. There was no supply chain management. There was no inventory. The purchasing was basically running to Walmart. So I was tasked with developing a process and procedures for this. At this point, I'd just like to paint a clear picture of what things were like for the people staying in this hotel. It was not a typical hotel experience. It all started at, in a First Nations community. If a First Nations person tested positive, First Nation and Inuit Health or the Tribal Council would determine whether the, it was safe for them to stay in the community. Due to overcrowding, as I mentioned earlier, it generally wasn't safe and most of them would be sent to Winnipeg to isolate. But it wouldn't just be the one person that tested positive. The entire family will ha would be sent to Winnipeg in order to isolate. Upon arrival in Winnipeg, they would get into an adapted van that had a dark plexiglass separating the people in the back from the driver. The driver would be in full PPE and they'd pull up to the back of the hotel and the doors would be opened by two security guards and there'd be three Red Cross employees 
all dressed in full PPE to meet the people for their hotel stay. I know that the first time that I saw people in PPE, it was intimidating, it was scary. I have no idea what it, was, what it must have been like for the children that arrived, having flown all the way from their community into Winnipeg to be met by people in full PPE. It could only have been terrifying. All of their luggage would have to be put into garbage bags and they would have to carry their luggage in themselves as no one was allowed to touch anything. The lobby would be completely emptied. There'd be five security guards lining the path for them to get to the elevators and they would be told not to touch anything. They would get into the elevators and greeted by a Red Cross employee in full PPE. At that time, they would have to identify which members of their family were COVID positive and which ones had just had contact with them. And at this point, they would be separated. There were floors that were exclusively for COVID positive. These were considered red zone. And there were floors for people that had contact with people that were COVID positive. These were considered yellow zones. So at this time, there were children saying goodbye to their mother or their father, and they wouldn't see them for two weeks. These, these people, oh, and then upon arriving on their floor, they would be met with a huge orange tarp that, that sealed off the hallway going to the rooms. There'd be a big zipper in the middle, and they'd op the Red Cross employee would open it up and allow them in, and they'd zip it behind them. And that would be the last time that they would be in anywhere public for two weeks. They'd go to their rooms, and they wouldn't be allowed to leave. If they were COVID positive, they wouldn't be allowed to leave uh, for two weeks. The people that were in contact had two 15-minute outdoor breaks each day. Their meals would be delivered to their rooms in styrofoam containers in plastic bags with plastic cutlery, generally lukewarm. It was restaurant food, but it wasn't great. They could order snacks and recreational items through a 1-800 number, but often people from northern communities weren't used to what we're used to, being on hold after phoning 1-800 numbers and choosing menu, you know, hit one for French, two for English and all of that. And they weren't used to that. So many of them just didn't bother. So they would never ask for anything. They wouldn't ask for bottles of water. They wouldn't ask for fruit. They wouldn't ask for any kind of recreational thing because it was intimidating for them. Their bed linens, towels, and personal laundry were laundered twice a week, and the rooms were not cleaned at all. Imagine some of the rooms with three to four children after 14 days with no cleaning service at all. This was not a holiday. This was not a typical hotel stay. With my years in the hospitality industry and my experience in purchasing and logistics, I felt that the Lord had truly put me into this situation to help improve it. And as I said, I jumped in with both feet. I identified all the opportunities to try to make a difference. One of the key ones was literally some of the people arrived with the clothes on their back. For 14 days, they were going to wear the same clothes. We did as much as we could purchasing underwear, t-shirts, socks, sweats, hoodies, anything we could stock, slippers, uh, to make their stay more comfortable. There were lots of babies that stayed in the hotel. We had to make sure we had formula, diapers, baby wipes, bottles. We even brought in play pens and high chairs and lots of little toys for them to have. We wanted to provide as many recreational items as possible, so we bought toys and games. We, uh, this was during the time of the non-essential um, sales, uh, so we couldn't buy a lot of the stuff, so we relied on Amazon. One of the things that people really wanted were books, but we couldn't buy books. Lynn will be very happy that I spent many mornings on my way to work 
checking out every free little library in town, taking books so that we could supply reading material. I feel very confident that people that donated books to little libraries would have been happy to know the people that received them. We also provided Bibles when people asked. And I even learned how you can get your hands on free rosaries in case anybody needs to know. After about two weeks, we had everything we needed. We were well stocked. I had instituted inventory systems. I had streamlined the purchasing systems. I had trained three logistics people on how to do it. I was watching the requests every day up until eight o'clock at night. I was getting lots of praise. I was feeling really good. I was filled with pride. Guess what happened next? I had a very large disagreement with one of my coworkers. We had a large argument because I had a way that I wanted things to be done. I had developed all the systems and I wanted them to be followed. Through our talking, tempers raged and I lost my temper. My lack of humility, in fact, my blind pride in myself, once again, led me to a destructive situation. Although I apologized profusely to my coworker, my hurtful words have stuck with them and is still a wedge between us today. The dark side of King Doug had reared its ugly head again. My undealt with pride and inflated self-worth caused me to break again, and I was broken. I went into self-hate in a sense that God was teaching me once again that this path just wasn't right for me. As I had entered into a contract to continue to help out for the, till the end of February, and this was only the second week of February, I really needed to have a light at the end of the tunnel. So Kath and I booked off two weeks for the first two weeks of March, and we were going to head back to the wilderness to just spend some time for me to heal and for us to just really look at where we were going from here. But it was also about this time that my boss in BC contacted me and told me that he was moving positions and he really wanted me to apply for his role as the logistics lead for Manitoba. Boy, was I torn. Here I had had just had a huge lesson in humility and now I was being told that I had what it took to be a senior manager. I really had no confidence in myself. I really didn't know that I could do that job. The recent flare-up with my uh, co-worker had revealed that my pride was still just under the surface and, the de and despite spending six months in the wilderness with self-discovery, I was really back where I had started back in May. I prayed and I prayed for direction. I did complete an application and I had what was told to me as an excellent interview. I was told that I was the front runner for the job. I started to come out of my funk and I focused on how I might be able to handle the role. It is a stressful role as the bulk of the work centers around disaster response, like fires and floods, where people need to be evacuated. It also is completely reliant on a volunteer workforce. I decided that if I could put some very strict work guidelines in place, like frequent time off, even if it was unpaid, and if I was perhaps to seek out a mentor to help me, to talk about and deal with my stress-inducing pride. I thought I could do the job. I didn't hear a lot over the next couple of weeks, but I did receive semi-regular emails saying I was still in the running and they were still considering me. Everything looked very good. Two days before I was to head back to the wilderness, the Lord did as he faithfully has done my whole life with his love and mercy and wanting only to give me what was best for me, the amazing Lord delivered. 
I didn't get the job. Thank you, Lord. I found out 36 hours before Kath and I headed out to the wilderness. Once again, my pride was hurt and I was a bit down, but really this time was different. I was able to see that the Lord was protecting me. He confirmed that King Doug still needed to deal with some stuff. He confirmed that I needed not to cast my eyes on shiny titles and flashy things like saving people from floods and fires, which inevitably would have probably led to a sense of pride. I needed to practice obedience, discipline, and focus on listening to the Holy Spirit and just take things as they came. The two weeks at the lake were wonderful. I was able to get myself out of my self-hate and disappointment in myself. I was able to truly say, Lord, here I am. Use me how you want. I felt a new sense of freedom. I know that I can trust the Lord. In fact, I must put my trust in him. Praise the Lord. I am back with the Red Cross, having returned from two weeks in the wilderness. I'm serving as a logistics lead, assisting in the vaccinations to the First Nations communities. I just completed my first week. I'm assisting three logistics reps that the Red Cross is loaning to First Nations and Inuit Health Branch to ensure that all 63 First Nation communities receive the right amount of vaccines and all the ancillary things like needles, but also the infrastructure needs like tents and chairs and tables for the vaccination centers. I'm also assisting the Red Cross teams that are going up to do the vaccinations by managing all their equipment, doing all their purchasing, and arranging their transportation to get up to the communities. I'm truly trying to have a new attitude. I would really appreciate your prayers. None of this is about me. This is all about helping others and being obedient to the Lord. A huge thank you, Lord, for the Bible in one year daily readings. They help me to focus each and every day. A huge thank you to, to the Lord for Chris asking me to do this talk. It's enabled me to look at my past year and write all this down and really examine and truly see what the Lord has done for me in the past year. Thank you, Lord, for taking care of Kath and I through all of this and for what you will do for and through us in the future. I am a work in progress, but it's not mine, it's the Lord's work. Thank you for listening to me today. I remain Servant Doug. Thank you. Well, Doug, thank you so much for sharing with us today. It just takes so much humility and openness to really um, share with your brothers and sisters like that. But thank you so much. And You're welcome. Let us all pray for Doug now. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for Doug, his life, and, and for Kath and, and all his loved ones. Lord, as we go through these journeys in the wilderness, sometimes it can seem quite difficult. But we just praise you and thank you for the ways you've worked through Doug's life, how you've journeyed with him, carried him at times, and Lord, even at times allowed him to walk alone so he could come back closer to you. Lord, we just ask that all of us listening here today will come to know you better through Doug's story and that we'll all come to appreciate what it means to seek you in our daily lives and to search ourselves as we do so. Lord, we just pray for Doug moving forward. May you continue to bless him and work through him, Lord. And may the servant Doug continue to grow while King Doug continues to walk away. So Lord, may you be with Doug, may you be with Kath, and may you continue to journey with them all the way to the finish line. We thank you so much. We pray this all in your heavenly name, Jesus.